Institute website um, by the end of today. Before we get things really started, um, this webinar is hosted by the Patient-Centered Primary Care Institute, with, which is a partnership that was launched in 2012 with the Oregon Health Authority to help get technical assistance and information out to folks working on the patient-centered primary care home or PCPCH or primary care home or medical home, as you, as you like it, uh, model of care. So we hope to get information out to practices at all stages of working on PCPCH. Um, and if you haven't poked around our website, pcpci.org, I would encourage you to do that. It's where you can find um, upcoming webinars like this one, recordings of more than 20 or maybe even 30 uh, webinars at this point on a variety of topics, a series of online learning modules about the PCPCH standards and more. You can register for our um, email newsletter that will let you know when there are additional webinars or in-person training opportunities available. So uh, like I mentioned, the um, Institute works with the uh, OHA PCPCH program. Um, and the PCPCH program is a set of standards that's defined by six core attributes um, that allow the state to recognize patient-centered primary care homes. You can get more information on the program at their website, which is primarycarehome.oregon.gov. And without further ado, I want to introduce our presenter, Darren Ford. Um, Darren is a research associate and training specialist for the Northwest Addiction and Technology Transfer Center, the Pacific Northwest node of a national network that's funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. Darren provides substance abuse training for primary care and behavioral health, teaching effective ways to engage in supporting patients with substance use disorders. He has an extensive background in trauma-informed care, and we're very pleased he's going to share that knowledge with us today. He also has an uh, extensive background in dialectical behavioral therapy, group therapy, substance use, and mental health. He is also faculty for Portland State University, a licensed clinical social worker, and a certified alcohol and drug counselor. So we are in good hands, and we'd like to welcome uh, Darren. Thank you. Thank you very much for that um, kind introduction. And um, for all of you that have joined in, um, it's such an honor to be working with um, all of you this morning in this um, amazing discussion of how much we are, ch how much the, um, the field of, um, of primary care and mental health and substance use um, has, has changed. Um, I've spent my last two years before I came on here working for um, an FQHC, so I worked with a lot of patients who did not have insurance or just started getting enrolled with um, Medicaid. And um, what I noticed early on working with a lot of patients in an FQHC is this was the first time they actually, a lot of them had access to health care access to mental health, access to drug and alcohol counseling, access to real support to help and deal with things. And this is where um, I didn't start my trauma-informed care, but where I really started seeing that trauma-informed care could definitely be utilized a lot more in primary care settings. Um, my background is is really working with um, Native American populations um, around addictions and mental health issues. And um, the Native American population has understood trauma-informed care for a very, very long time, um, meaning that, you know, survivors of the Holocaust, um, relocation, assimila assimilation, um, intergenerational, multi-generational trauma that has impacted um, the Native American population, they have understood for very much a long time how trauma has um, impacted their community as well as their wellness and have really have amazing stories and ways of healing around that community. I wanted to make sure this is working. Hold on. Oh, there we go. Okay, so today what um, I'm really hoping to get from this is I'm really hoping to break away from the pathology of mental health and actually the pathology of um, harmful behaviors like substance use um, and um, self-harm um, behaviors that people people go into um, to get out of their experiences. I really want to have discussion around how trauma manifests in our emotions, our cognitive, and our processing, as well as our behaviors. Um, and I also want to validate 
a lot of you that are probably here today um, for the work that you're probably already doing and the advocacy that you have for trauma survivors um, that you work for in your population. So we're really going to talk about a lot of those issues today and, and really would like to hear from some of you if you can chime in about how you've been champions in the agencies that you're working at or no champions. And then we'll talk a little bit at the end towards, well, how do we start this process of becoming a lot more trauma-informed care within our agencies? So I'm going to start off with a case presentation. And this is actually, this, this case presentation is built around an actual person that I work with um, the last two years at um, OHSU and their family medicine FQHC. And we're going to call her Tammy. All right. And as you can see from the very beginning here, we have a problems list. So I have an issue with the word problem right from the start, and I still struggle with this word because problem for me starts the bias right up front, that Tammy has problems. And I can actually take on that idea and that meaning whenever I meet with Tammy. So even right there, I, I struggle with that word. But for the sake of this is what I see when I'm in an electronic medical record, we're going to talk about Tommy, Tammy's problem list. So as you can see, Tammy has a lot of stuff going on with her. And one of the reasons I got connected with Tammy was because of two things on here that were most importantly impacting a lot of her other physical wellness. Um, her history of poly substance use, which means she was um, dependent on alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, and methamphetamine, which also impacted acute hospital stays brought on by manic episodes, usually methamphetamine induced and sometimes cannabis induced, and even a few times alcohol induced, but it would also impact um, her suicidal ideation. Tammy never went into any behaviors to actually complete any suicide, but she did have a lot of suicidal ideation, especially around her history of polysubstance use. But more importantly, what I want to talk about real quick is when I started working in family medicine, this is really how the clinic would respond to Tammy. A lot of panic. Um, all these people in these pictures are kind of representations of the care that was being provided to Tammy every time she came in. The front desk had a lot of anxiety. The MA was, just did not want to work with her. The physician many times said, I, I have no idea what to do with Tammy when she comes in. Um, our behavioral health staff had worked with her many, many times. Um, and the administration was like a few times because Tammy had been threatening, um, thought maybe we should just send her to another clinic. So there was a lot of stress even around the clinic when Tammy would come in. And in many ways, um, the clinic was just as reactive as Tammy. The reason why is because this is actually what a typical office visit looked like for Tammy when she would come in. Um, Tammy's visits were usually followed by a lot of distress. Um, she was very manic. Um, a lot of the times when she would come in, um, extremely angry, and her anger would sometimes even turn into threats. Um, the behavioral health staff and the physicians, a lot of the times they felt like, wow, we're just putting out fires every time she would come into the office. And Tammy had a lot of paranoia. She was very, very paranoid and very concerned about a lot of things um, that were going on in her life. There was actually a few times when I would work with Tammy and she would demand me to call the police. Um, about certain issues that were going on. And um, what I learned over time was, number one, when Tammy would come into our clinic, it was triggering for her, which meant that, there, that when she came in, she was losing kind of a sense of her own control. And so for Tammy, going into anger, even going into psychosis, even going into threats was a way of controlling her experience. Because think about it, when we go to a doctor's office or even when we go to counseling, our job sometimes is to be evasive. And for many of our patients who have been impacted by trauma, being evasive is a very scary thing and probably brings on a lot of the stuff that has happened for people in the past. Getting Tammy outside of the office, which is what I had the opportunity to do, I learned a lot about her. And one of the first things Tammy was able to tell me was, she was raised by um, bikers. 
And the reason that she was raised by bikers is because at age 11, she ran away from home. She was one of six kids, and she was the oldest. And her, her parents, um, who had split up at a very young age, and mom was basically the one that was the caregiver, was also in the grasp of an addictive behavior. So mom really was not available emotionally, cognitively, um, to really kind of help out. So Tammy had to take on the role of a, as a parent at a very young age. And through that process and that distress, Tammy ran away and lived on the streets until um, a biker gang took her in. And that biker gang taught her how to hustle, taught her how to work the streets, taught her how to sell drugs, and taught her how to survive. And Tammy spent probably about a good solid 20 years living on the streets and just surviving. And so when I think about that, you know, I start to think about the actual strengths that Tammy has and what Tammy has been bringing to the table, especially in the clinic. We have a, a tendency um, within um, our field when we look at somebody's behaviors um, that for us maybe is not the way that we would cope and deal with conflict or problems, problem solving. Um, when we look at Tammy's, I see them actually as coping strategies. You know, she has been doing the best that she can with what she knows how to do. And she's a survivor, incredible surviving skills just to get by. The problem was, were they effective over time? And in the clinic, they really, really impacted the overall wellness of how well we were able to work with her and how well Tammy was able to work. What we saw during um, the peak of symptoms with Tammy were a couple of things going on. So there were anniversaries. And what anniversaries meant for, for Tammy is Tammy also was a mom. And she had two kids. And she had lost both of her kids um, to custody to another family member due to um, continually just being in survival mode. And those reminders during the year when she lost her kids, holidays, birthdays, maybe even the time when Child Protective Services took away her, her children, they were really, really difficult times for Tammy and reminders of those traumatic events, along with a lot of unfortunate exploitation that was going on in Tammy's life. Tammy had been sexually assaulted by somebody that was actually trying to help her at a young age. And she had, when I was working with her, had actually been exploited economically and sexually by her caregiver that was supposed to be helping her out. We saw during these times of exploitations and anniversary of trauma in Tammy's life, we saw substance use peak as a behavior, and she became very non-active in taking care of herself. She wasn't using her insulin anymore. She wasn't exercising. She wasn't eating healthy. And these were times when we realized, boy, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on in her life that is impacting her wellness. So if you think about it, Tammy's experience was a normal response to trauma. Tammy told me a few times, because she was very smart, very in touch, very connected, and when you got her out of the primary care setting and got, took her for a walk in the park or had coffee, actually emotions very regulated, very present, very able to process a lot of what was going on with her, um, Tammy said that what her life felt like was when she was driving around in a car, she would look in the rearview mirror and she would see police lights on. And if any of you know what that's like to be pulled over, it's a pretty scary, um, distressful experience. And Tammy really said, this is how I feel all the time, which kind of explains the paranoia. That kind of explains the threatening issues and also the anger that Tammy was going into. It was this, her relived experiences were very real to her, even in those moments. Um, and if you think about it, all of these things, living with bikers, running away, being sexually assaulted, kind of impacted um, her overall wellness. So one of the things I would like you guys to think about, and you're more than welcome to type in messages. I'd love to hear um, from some of the other experts here in the room around the issue of adverse experiences. But how do you feel Tammy's adverse experiences would impact physical behavior, behavioral health, um, and also mental health issues? And how it impacts a lot of the stuff that we see on this list. Um, 
background stuff that she's that she's gone through. So throughout this time, if anybody would like to chime in or type in a message, um, I'll be glad to read it aloud here. Um, and just a this. reminder, folks, you can do that through the chat or through the questions pane. Don't be shy. We'd love to hear um, anything that you'd like to share with the group. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, I'd absolutely love to hear from some of you um, around um, stories of um, resilience, stories of su success, because um, I will tell you a little bit at the end about Tammy. Tammy has had incredible success um, since um, the clinic has become a lot more trauma-informed care. Her physicians have become trauma-informed care. Um, her MAs. Um, the behavioral health staff. Um, Tammy has just felt love and support. And I'm going to tell you that that went a long way. And we're going to talk a little bit about the science around that. So really, if, if, if you want the nutshell and, and, and the basic understanding of what trauma-informed care really means to most people is not looking at what is wrong with people, but what has happened to them. That's why I struggle with that word problem list and some of the other issues that are going on. Because what happens a lot of the times is we as providers and healthcare professionals, we can go into shame or we can go into blame without really looking at what has happened to that patient. And when we have an understanding of what has happened with the patient, we have a tendency to be a lot more empathic which means that we're not as reactive and then we, ha we can be a lot more responsive for a patient who has gone through some very difficult things and as I said, is just doing the best that she can. So really breaking from that problem mind, problemless mindset that I very, very much can be guilty of and get stuck in. And just another, a, a quick caveat on this. Um, if we're having the issue of blaming and shaming, um, just think how the patient is feeling about themselves when they come walking through that door, um, where they have probably been blamed and shamed so many times throughout this system. So really, trauma-informed approach is based on recognizing that many of these behaviors have value and have meaning. They may not be the healthiest, they're definitely not the most effective, but they are a response that is expressed by people has, who have survived trauma. And so it's really, really important when we understand the meaning behind the behavior, we can really kind of get to um, a lot of the issues that have been going on with um, a lot of our patients that experience this. I'm a fan of rock and roll, and um, one of my favorite um, musicians is a, is a guy named Johnny Thunders. And um, one of the, I, I grew up listening to Johnny Thunders um, at a very young age, and um, this is this is a song he wrote called Chinese Rock. Um, the Ramones were actually kind of famous for playing it, but he actually wrote the song. And the song is really about kind of the adverse living around heroin addiction, and um, the impact that heroin had on his life. And this is probably a glimpse or a snapshot of what it was like for him being in the grasp of this addictive behavior. Now, I did a little bit of research on Johnny Thunders and said, hmm, I wonder what adversity looked like in Johnny Thunders' life growing up. And this is what I found. His mother died at birth. His father left shortly after that. And he struggled with heroin at a very, very young age and actually ended up dying at age 38 of a methadone overdose. Um, and there's actually still a possibility that he could have been murdered, but there's really no um, evidence to really prove that. But if we think about it, Johnny Thunders, even at a young age, um, he experienced adversity through loss. And actually, if we go back to this um, poster here, um, the mantra on this poster says, Born to Lose. And that's actually a song that he wrote. Um, on, on one of his albums called LAMF, and I really see this more as born into loss or born, born to lose people, because I think that implicitly is what Johnny Thunders was actually thinking, thinking about and focusing on, was he had dealt with tremendous loss at a very young age, and how he coped with a lot of his loss was through substance use. A, sad, a sadder issue is Sid Vicious, who um, is another person that I'm very, very much a fan of. Um, I was a big fan of the Sex Pistols. Um, he was actually, his name was John Beverly. And John Beverly actually met Johnny Thunders in England when Johnny Thunders' band went on tour with the Sex Pistols. And Johnny Thunders um, wrote a song called Sad Vacation about Sid Vicious. And in the song, 
um, Johnny Thunders, said that he introduced Sid Vicious to heroin. And if we even look at Sid Vicious's life, um, you can see that his father left him at an early age. His stepfather died of cancer during childhood. His mother was also a heroin user, and actually when um, Sid Vicious became addicted to heroin, um, his mom and him would actually use heroin together. And so that really probably, and that, that dynamic and that relationship is something that would be probably fascinating to explore. But Sid Vicious died of a heroin overdose, and a few years ago they actually released the police report and found that... Um, that his mother was the one that gave him the poisonous dose that killed him. He had just been released from jail. And um, his mom did not want to see him going to prison for the rest of his life for the suspected murder of his girlfriend and felt that he would be more at peace dying. And she was the one that gave him the poison dose that killed him. So why do we remedy? And what I mean by remedy is I'm talking about Sid Vicious using heroin, Johnny Thunders using heroin, people going into um, harmful behaviors to get out of very, very painful experiences that we've had. Well, I think that the most important study that has come out in the past 20 years has been the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. And I'm hoping that some of you guys are familiar with this, but if you're not, that's okay. But it was... Um, created actually by somebody that worked at Kaiser um, Permanente named Dr. Vincent Felitti. And Dr. Vincent Felitti, um, what he found was that um, in, in back in the 80s, actually the mid-80s, that he was working with women who had obesity issues. And I think the range was from 100 pounds to 600 pounds overweight. And what he was finding was half of the um, people in the clinic were, that he was working with were dropping out. Even when they were losing weight, they were dropping out. And for him, they were losing weight, but they were leaving, and it just didn't make sense. And so one time, on accident, he asked a question to one of his patients. And this is pretty fascinating. Um, he asked a patient um, how old she was, or how, how, what was her weight the first, excuse me, what was her weight the first time she had sex? And the woman replied, I was 40 pounds. Now, doctor, I, I love Dr. Felitti because he's so humbling. He just said, well, maybe I didn't ask the question right. He was just so clueless, and I love that he was clueless about this. Excuse me, I don't understand. What do you mean 40 pounds? The woman started crying. And when she started crying, she said, don't you understand? I was four years old when I was sexually assaulted and raped by my father. Right there, that changed his whole mindset, and he said, oh, my God. I have been missing this very important variable around obesity, which is what got him to start studying and understanding what was going on in this situation. And so what he realized was that adverse childhood experiences, trauma at a very early age, was impacting how people were dealing with their emotions and their, and their thoughts. In return, this actually impacted them to adopt a health risk behavior. In the case of obesity, eating to solve dealing with social and emotional cognitive impairment. Think about it. Eating releases dopamine. It's, a, it's that drive. It's that good feeling that we get. And what that would end up doing is that would end up turning into disease, disability, and social problems which unfortunately for many patients, and they did a really dense research study here, 17,000 patients, and these were not poor patients, all right? These were um, actual patients that um, were middle class and had access to health care, but they were dying 25 young, years younger than other people. And that's really where people started going, oh my God, there's this huge connection here between this issue of trauma, um, social, emotional, and cognitive impairments, um, healthy risk behaviors, and then finally at the onset of disease and social problems. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. Um, I, I'm going to speed through a few other things for the amount of time, but I just really wanted to hit those pieces home so we can understand where this, where trauma-informed care kind of came from. Oh, and by the way, thank you, Kate. Um, you put up the ACE study um, org. I really appreciate that. It's a great study. Please go back and read it. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. Another person that I'm a fan of is, 
fan of is the physician Gabor Mate. And Gabor Mate is actually going to be speaking in July here. Um, he's the keynote speaker for um, one of the addictions conferences. And I actually had an opportunity to hang out with him and, um, and, and go to a couple of his seminars last year. And one of the things Gabor Mate said that really kind of responds to the A study in trauma is the medical model and the behavioral health model, they do a good job of, of explaining the physiology of physical health and mental health issues that go on with people that have been impacted by trauma. But what they don't really do is they don't explain the environment in which trauma happens. And what we're talking about here is policies, um, racism, gender discrimination, um, sexual, sexuality um, discrimination, um, intergenerational trauma. These things really have a a huge impact on adversity and the wellness of other people. And denying these antecedents or denying these variables when looking at this is really missing a huge, gigantic um, piece of this puzzle or this picture that we have to work with when, when looking at people that have been impacted by trauma, or trauma survivors, as I like to call them. So when we think about it, behaviors that patients go into that are not healthy are not wrong, there's actually a lot of right things that are going on in them. If we think about it, it's a way for patients to ex control their experiences. Okay? It is remedy seeking within itself. Going back to that A study, you know, a lot of women who ate a lot of food it was a way of self-soothing um, during times of interpersonal distress, or actually, as Felitti would say, it was possibility of gaining weight in order to keep um, men away or women away keeping people the way that have possibly been abusers. But the problem with remedy seeking is it's paradoxical, which means it's a double-edged sword. For something that we seek pleasure or fulfillment from can come with consequences and come, and come at a price. One other real quick um, case study is um, Florence Ballard, who was actually um, a member of Diana Ross and the Supremes. And if you see the movie Dream Girls, Jennifer Hudson, I believe her character was based on Florence Ballard. Um, I'm a big fan of Motown music and um, as we can see here, um, she also experienced some adverse adversity at a very young age um, and she actually died of a heart attack. Um, but one of the reasons she was kicked out of Diana Ross and the Supremes is because she was continually intoxicated. But if you can see that there was this early onset of trauma that happened in her life and this is how she self-soothed. This is how she regulated her emotions. This is how she remedied um, a lot of that real physical and emotional pain that was going on in her life. And unfortunately, it did end up taking her life. And she was actually kicked out of the ban for her continued intoxications. What I think about with Florence Ballard is, you know, if we would have had a diagnosis for PTSD, if we had had access to people to have support with substance use, if we would have had an understanding of trauma um, so, so long ago, maybe she would still be around. Maybe she would still be doing, giving us um, her gifts of music. So those are the things I think about here when I think about this, the importance and the need of this understanding. We all lose and we all miss out when people are traumatized. One quick other study to kind of just back this stuff up just a little bit more. Um, the CAGE study is a very interesting study, or what they call Rat Park. So Rat Park was based around this idea of addiction. And what they, what they did was they wanted to see um, how addictive a property was to um, rats. And so what they would do is they would put rats in a cage. And they put rats in a cage and they gave regular water and then morphine-laced water. And I think they also did this with some other substances, but morphine is, was, the, was the one that I remember or recall the most. And what they found was um, after the rat being, the, the rat would always turn to the morphine-laced water um, every single time, no longer used the regular water and ended up dying of neglect because it would just become dependent on the morphine. And all these people went, aha, there we go, see? Morphine, that's the addiction. Cocaine, that's the addiction. That's the hook. That's what gets people addicted. Well, several years later, along came the Vietnam War. And over in the Vietnam, actually, um, morphine use spiked. And think about it, you're in a very scary situation. 60,000 people died in this war. Um, you're in life and death struggles. Morphine was a way of coping with the traumatic experiences that you had over there. So you had a lot of people in Vietnam that were highly addicted to um, morphine. And so what happened is when they came home, all of a sudden that spike in morphine use went down. And then all of a sudden, 
people were no longer addicted to morphine, the vets that were coming back from Vietnam, and everybody was going, well, wait a minute, this kind of contradicts that study, that cage study. So um, a gentleman came along, and oh gosh, I'm, I'm going brain dead right now, I'll, I'll come up with his name in a moment, but um, another um, psychologist came along, and he decided to re do the study, and what he did this time around was he put the same exact rats that they used, he put them in an environment that was enjoyable to rats. And if you look at this um, picture on the right with the sawdust and the cans, um, it may not look like a fun environment to us, but to a rat, this is heaven. This is a stimulating environment. They, put, they created an amazing social environment, um, just awesome. And they put in, as you can see these two bottles, morphine laced and regular laced water. And guess what they found out? they actually found out that none of the rats turned to the morphine-laced water. The reason why? Because they were getting their basic needs, their social needs um, met within Rat Park. And so what they did was they replicated the study again with the cage rats and got all the rats morphine dependent again and then put them in Rat Park. And guess what? They found out that all of them titrated from the morphine and actually got engaged in the community there and did not go back to the morphine-laced water. So what they realized is, is that it was the cage that was causing the addiction, the trauma of feeling boxed in, the trauma of having nowhere to go, the trauma of having no meaning and purpose in our lives. So that's how behaviors manifest and become problems. When people lose meaning and purpose in their lives due to the impact of adversity, um, they go into the best way of handling and coping and dealing with those problems in the best way. The problem is these behaviors can have a detrimental impact, not only on their, socials, their, social, um, their social lives, but their physical lives. Real quick, well, I'm going to go over this real quick. Um, so one of the other things we have to understand that is a lot of this behavior manifests at a very young age. Um, children are when they're born, infants when they're born are born premature. And what that means is their neomammalian brain, their prefrontal lobes, that area where they, um, they think is really not developed at all. And this is really through the birthing process. The, the head has to be very small to pass through um, the birth canal. And to do that, and, and because of that, um, they're very dependent on caregivers at a very early age. Now when a caregiver, when, when a child is raised with a caregiver in a healthy environment that is non-stressed and the caregiver is emotionally available and constantly there, that child's neuro activity develops properly and is able to do some amazing things. It can explore its environment knowing that it's safe, it can develop health, healthy, a healthy brain, and it can lead to becoming its own independent self while still depending on others. It's a really good healthy balance, and that's what we call a secure attachment. What happens in, in um, homes or in communities and places that don't have access to health care, poverty, neglect, or even middle class homes where there's been trauma, is a lot of the times, not all the times, but a lot of the times, the exact opposite. Um, insecure attachments. Um, are um, developed within children. And that's really just a survival mechanism that our brain goes into to try to do its best it can to respond to its environment. So if a caregiver is not there, or is not reliable, or is exaggerated in its response, becomes physically or verbally abusive towards a child, or neglectful, that brain and that child is going to do its best to survive which can a lot of the times turn into ineffective coping mechanisms or ineffective behaviors in order to get that need met. This has a profound impact on a child's brain. Um, this, can, this can be seen, as, as we can see, with a lot of patients in pathologic trauma, um, poor self-esteem, struggles with self-regulation, um, very low tolerance, um, uh, very low frustrations of tolerance. So think, think about addiction. Think about overeating. Think about gambling. Think about workaholism. Think about how these would impact somebody um, dealing with tolerance. Um, but one of the things, and like I said, wanting to break away sometimes from that pathology of mental health is really looking at anxiety and mood disorders. Um, a lot of the times an insecure attachment style can be seen as anxiety or a mood disorder. But what you're actually dealing with is how somebody interacts with the world that is just not an effect. So it's really not why the addiction, but why the pain. 
if we start to understand the pain that our patients go through and not the problems that um, have been created for this, we will have a better understanding of what our patients are going through and a lot of times be able to connect with them in a different way and in return they will experience things very, very different from us. So we have to always understand when a patient walks through the door, they're not just walking in with themselves, they're walking in with everything that has impacted them throughout their lives, the good and the bad, and they're just doing the best they can to cope and deal with that moment. Last piece on Gabor Mate that I think is important. Hold on, there we go. Is this? Oops, went too far. Okay. Um, I like this metaphor um, about what happens when we plant a seed. So if I was to take a seed and put it on my desk that I'm that I'm sitting at right now, and hope for it to grow, it wouldn't grow very well. And the reason why it wouldn't grow very well is because it doesn't have the right environment to grow in. It needs water. It needs soil. It needs sunlight. It needs an environment in which to flourish. People are just like seeds. When they do not have an environment to flourish in, they don't have the soil, which could be housing, transportation, social community. When they don't have water, which is health care, um, wellness, meaning, purpose. When they don't have um, sunshine, which is hope. When they don't have these things in their lives, they're just not going to flourish. And we have to start seeing the whole picture of a person instead of that one 20-minute office visit that we get. I wish we had a profound impact in that short time that we get with our patients, but there's just so much out there that also impacts their lives. So back at the beginning of the discussion um, around ACE, um, we kind of really started to see what Felitti was kind of talking to here. Okay, The reason why Felitti was not being successful with many of his patients that were in the grasp um, of obesity was because there was an underlying issue that he was not making a connection with. And really the message that I want to say here is that we're no good to any of our trauma survivors until we are mindful of the trauma that has impacted their lives. We can become just as reactive as our patients in these situations. And really the goal and the success of trauma-informed care is to become more responsive in those moments. And that, as I said, going back to the Gabor Mate piece on the seed, this last piece at the bottom, looking at the whole person's illness and health, um, everything that's interacting with them. Real quick caveat, um, the ACE study has shown how expensive trauma is on our system. Um, I just got done working on a grant for two years when I was at this FQHC, and we found that um, I think it was 15% of the Medicaid recipients were using over 80% of the resources. And when I started looking at the population of the Medicaid patients that were using the majority of the resources due to high utilization of ED, ER, psychiatric wards, what we found was that the majority of them had an adverse um, experience very, very early on in their life. And um, were dealing with diseases, disabilities, and social problems that were having a huge expense on our overall system. So the ACE study really shows us that trauma is costing us a lot of money. And the hard part here is that this is this most, one of the most expensive yet treatable issues that we have. This is treatable. I feel that a lot of this is very much man-made, which means that we can actually do something about it. And I think that the biggest piece is just disseminating the awareness of trauma. So, Real quick piece on this, and we don't have time to go into this unfortunately today, but I just wanted to say that trauma is a two-way street. And what I mean is that our physicians, our MAs, our um, behavioralists, our front desk staff, our administrators, all these hardworking people in our amazing industry can also be impacted by our patients' um, trauma. We call that vicarious trauma. And it's so important for us to be able to take care of ourselves and utilize trauma stewardship during these times. Um, because if we don't, we could really, really be um, worn out. And I'm going to just give a quick example of me. So I'm a clinical social worker, and I think the vicarious trauma I experienced the most in my field was when I would work with elders or geriatrics that were in the grasp of addiction or, had, or were dying, and I couldn't get them access to housing. 
and how traumatic that was for me not being able to do that for them and taking a lot of that guilt and that hurt and that pain home with me into my own life. And so that's how a lot of trauma, that's how a lot of trauma can impact even our own lives. And I think that if we can start kind of supporting each other on these issues, we'll, we'll, we'll do a much better job. So I was told at my FQHC that 40% of the wellness was actually impacted by behavior at the, um, the last family medicine place I saw, which means that understanding trauma is really, really important because when we look at the behavior that's causing a lot of the symptoms of diseases, um, what we're seeing is people getting out of their experiences in some, some pretty unhealthy ways that are going to un unfortunately impact um, their lives um, in some pretty pretty devastating ways in the, in the long run. And so the way that I kind of take an approach now when working with patients with addiction issues are co-occurring issues that are going on in their lives. And um, I'm going to put access to diagnosis, which are your personality disorders, you know, borderline personality, antisocial. Um, I really see um, trauma now as the expectation and not the exception to the rule. So if we really kind of just have that in mind, we can more psychologically prepare ourselves to cope and deal with the patients that come in for trauma. We can take better care of ourselves. We can anticipate there's the, the, there might be some rough roads in doing this. So some of the things that actually implicitly cause triggers for patients um, in, um, in um, clinical settings are um, innovative invasive procedures, okay, and we all know we have to do invasive procedures. I mean, it's an important piece. Even as a, as a, as a clinician, I am invasive when, I, when I'm um, challenging patients on um, a lot of the, the, the issues that are going on in their lives. But what, one of the things we can do about invasive procedures is we can just ask permission before we do something. A lot of the times that will actually help to regulate emotions for patients that are already probably triggered um, that come in. Think about removing clothing. If we've dealt with a patient that's a, that's a survivor of rape or sexual assault, asking permission, would it be okay right now if you were to actually remove your clothing? Physical touch, is it okay if I touch you? Personal questions, this is something that I have to deal with a lot. I'm wondering, would it be okay if we talked about some personal stuff? Predict the future for them. I might be talking about some stuff that's kind of scary right now, and I'm just wondering if it's okay. Would it be okay to do that? Power dynamics and relationships. We need to get to that patient-centered care model. As much as as hard as it can be for some for, for us sometimes, especially in program-driven systems, we need to really start having our patients be more the experts in guiding us, even with stuff that we don't agree with. That's our issue, not our patient's issue. Um, gender is the healthcare provider. I always ask before I work with a female patient or transgender patient, um, are you okay with me? Is this going to be all right? You know, give them control. Give them say. Vulnerable physical positions. What this means is a lot of the times patients are cornered in a room with the door being blocked or access. You sometimes have two or three people in at a time in a small room um, just asking, is it okay if we close the door? Is it okay that I'm in front of you? And then loss and lack of privacy. Huge one, especially for our patients. So. On this side, um, and this is all research-based, just to let you know, these are the things that, by doing qualitative studies, we found that patients are impacted the most, that have been impacted by trauma the most, feel when they walk into clinical settings. All right? And then the intrusive practices are on the right, the things that really kind of trigger patients more or stop patients from coming or being not adherent. Um, and the, number, the reason why I put lack of follow-up at the top is that's the most important one. Patients really want to be heard, and they want to make sure that people are following through um, with what's going on. That, that following up is such a huge, amazing, simple intervention that really makes patients feel like they're heard. Um, so just, just be very, very aware of those. So when a patient does walk into the office, 
these are then some things that we have to be aware of. Um, the emotional reaction one is also very, very loud. I mean, I think it's very obvious, behavioral reactions and cognitive reactions, um, especially TBI. We have to understand that many patients that are trauma survivors have um, traumatic brain injury and cannot process their executive functioning, um, cannot process as well. But the one that I want to be very, very mindful of that sometimes we're just not connecting with is the somatic rea reactions or physical reactions. Um, sometimes they, could, they label it conversion disorders, um, stuff like that. But a lot of the times these issues can impact a trauma in a way, uh, can impact or trigger a patient in a way that we're just not aware of. I had a patient who was diagnosed with a conversion disorder, and the minute that um, she realized that the, the, the office visit was over, she would say, I'm paralyzed and I cannot move. And so we had to do a lot of what we call um, sensory motor um, integration around that, working with her, because there's lots of trauma in her life to kind of help her through those. So some of the things that I want you to think about is, so how, can, how do we deal with this? How, what, what do we start doing to start implementing trauma-sensitive care and practice? All right. Well, number one, we have we have to change our mind shift. We can't just ask patients to change. We have to, we have to change our mind shift of how we see patients. Um, we have to really start kind of taking what they call a strength-based approach, okay? And really kind of start finding meaning in the behaviors that our, our patients are doing. We have to be mindful of the invasive practices that we do. Always ask permission before proceeding with everything. Be very mindful of our labels. Um, if I had a dime for every time I've heard somebody say, oh, that patient's just borderline, they're just manipulating, they're triangulating, they're shopping, you know. These behaviors, like I said, they have meaning and they are resourceful for them. This is how our patients have survived. I think that it really comes back to this. If I had to summarize it all up into one sentence, I, I think that this is probably one of the most powerful ones that is there. So please understand, our patients are the experts. If we have patients like Tammy, who are 50 years old and have been able to survive this long, they know a lot about what works and does not work for them. And getting back to Tammy, that's what we did. We worked with Tammy on what Tammy wanted to do with, her, with, with healing, what Tammy wanted to take care of in her lives. And maybe they weren't the priorities the doctor or me as the behavioralist wanted, but they're what Tammy wanted. And believe it or not now, she has not gone back to the hospital in two years. She got involved with mental health. She has been really, really good on her medications. She has lost 20 pounds, and she is exercising every day, and she um, has stayed now stable in her housing for, for quite a few years. So in many ways, this trauma-informed model that was created disrupted a lot of the processes that could continue to cause harm in Tammy's life. Will she ever be perfect? No. Will there be relapse? Oh, yes. But that's okay. It, the situations in her life are already bad. Trauma-informed care is just about making sure that they're just not made any worse. So trauma is really about being mindful, okay, about relationship building. When we build relationships, when we build alliance with our patients, we actually build care. And for many of our patients, until we do not build that alliance, we will, we're absolutely no good to them. All right? We have to get as many people as possible involved um, in this process of um, understanding um, the survivor, um, of, of, of understanding trauma-informed care. Because by having everybody on the same page, we all realize that we can be part of the solution to this problem. Um, this was an important one because it came up Friday in the group when I was working with the MAs in the front desk. Um, there are many people that work in our field that are trauma survivors themselves, and they're maybe not open about it. Maybe they're not talking about it, maybe they, and they don't have to talk about it. They don't have to share it with us. But just to be mindful when we're saying words like borderline or addiction or these, that we may have people on our staff who have been in therapy and have gotten support and, and, and healed and are doing the best they can, but they also have possibly been impacted by trauma. And we have to, you, in order to do this, you know, to do it effectively, um, this will be kind of the last piece that I'll talk about here. Um, we, you can't just say, 
we're going to put trauma-informed care in place. There, there's, there's kind of a strategy that needs to be put up, put in place. Strategic planning, steering committees, um, assessing for what needs to be done within the clinic to make it more trauma-informed care. And trust me, I could do a whole entire training just on that alone. Um, there's some really good material out there um, that that really kind of helps with that issue. But one of the things you can do is you do a walkthrough and you have somebody pretend to be the patient and the experience from checking in to getting an exam to checking out and seeing where there's areas where we could be a lot more mindful about how a patient can be impacted by trauma. Um, one example I'll give you is one time I was in an ED visiting um, a patient and I walked to the child's um, ED ward just for a moment just to kind of check in and see some stuff and it was during Halloween and I saw tombstones on the doors of the children's um, on, uh, of, of, of the children's rooms. Now for kids, I mean, that would probably be funny and it's Halloween and yes, we want to be able to kind of connect them with the holidays, but I think about a parent walking in there and a parent seeing a tombstone, a parent seeing a skeleton and those representations of death. And so those are the kind of things that we have to kind of be mindful and how triggering those can be for somebody during that time. So it really is about safety, all right? Um, creating a place that is both physically and emotionally safe, not just for our patients, but for our staff. Um, it's about supporting patient control and choice. And remember, all right, validating a patient's control and choice doesn't mean that we have to like it. We don't have to say that it's okay. We're just giving it room and acknowledging that it's there. If a patient says, well, I'm going to continue to drink no matter what, validating, well, if I was in your situation, um, that would be one way that, yeah, somebody would cope and deal with what's happened with them. We're not telling them that that's okay and that's right. We're just kind of validating that this is where they're at. We're meeting them where, where they're at in that situation. It's, remember, again, it's about creating an alliance with our patient. And this other one, working with Native Americans for as long as they did, ensuring that we're culturally competent with what we're doing uh, and, um, around issues, just making sure that... Um, We've done everything we can to make a patient feel safe and comfortable with the environment that they're in. So I would like to leave this last five minutes, if possible, because we've got about 30 people that are still attending in this, I've noticed. Um, I would like to leave this open for any questions or maybe some responses that people would look like to have. I'd like to hear from some of the audience, if that's okay. Please don't be shy. I'd like Hi, to answer some uh, stuff. This is Kate. I have a couple of questions that have come in. And then again, folks, um, the GoToWebinar control panel is your friend. Go ahead. Any, um, any thoughts that you'd like to share, um, any questions that you have, go ahead and type those into the um, control panel there. Um, there are two questions we have now. The first is, do you approach adult trauma differently? So in other words, the patient had a, a happy, safe childhood, but experienced multiple losses and traumas as an adult. I, I, I treat them both exactly the same. Um, the re what the research actually shows, that, that's a great question, by the way, because I've, I've actually had it a few times. And um, this isn't true for 100%, but for a lot of our patients who had a great, amazing, safe, wonderful um, childhood experience, um, and then later on in their lives had a trauma, car accident, a... Um, um, a rape, a death in a family, um, or a physically assaulted, um, um, they can still have that trauma and they're, they're very, very much impacted by that trauma. But a lot of the times you'll find that there's a lot more resiliency in that patient, which means that yes, we're still going to want to give them psychoeducation, have them, have, have, let them have an understanding of how trauma can manifest in behaviors, emotions, cognitive. And I don't really take that approach, you have to understand, of trauma as a mental health issue. I take it as that survival mode that patients go into. Um, one example I'll give you is they did a study, um, and I don't have it with me, but they did a study on, uh, on Gulf War vets and found that Gulf War vets that had a really good secure attachment style, which means they grew up in a, a, a caregiving environment that was safe and, and they were able to explore and stuff. When they came back, even though they've been through some horrific stuff, they actually had a stronger resiliency and they were, be able, they were able to land better on their feet when they got back. Um, what they found was the patients who had an adverse childhood experience, grew up in a pretty unstable environment, and then went to war and were traumatized on top of that, they're the ones that really usually struggled the most. So, yes. There is, um, yes, um, I would still treat them the same way because you, you, you're never not so sure, but at the same time, this, the research does show that people that have had, um, 
had a, a good a good enough upbringing also have a lot more resiliency. Um, so two other um, questions that we had. The first was how, and I'm just going to read them both, and you can answer okay. them in, in whatever order makes sense. How do you make registration um, less menacing for people? Do you do intake on the phone, or, or what are some strategies around that? And then the other question was around, you know, um, I, there are a lot of physicians who who understand this, but um, but they are still feel very burdened and overwhelmed by dealing with patients who have so many issues and can present in their office with so many problems and and be so disruptive. So. How would you sort of acknowledge and, and get um, folks started thinking about how, how if they can um, maintain their, their patience and their, um, their fortitude um, in, in working with these folks? Okay, so that's, woo. like I said, that, those are two really heavy, um, loaded questions. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I guess when I talk about, when I hear the physician's issue um, that comes up, this is the one probably that I deal with the most, and um, I, I've worked with many physicians who a lot of the time, they just don't feel like they're even able to be doctors in these moments because they are, they're, they're working with a patient that is so complex and has so many complex issues going on. They're like, oh my God, what I'm doing every time they come in is just putting out fires, and instead of a 20-minute office visit, it turns into an hour, and then I'm behind in my schedule. I've got 20 other patients to see, and that that can be absolutely difficult. Some things that, like I said, that have to be done up front in order to make the those changes kind of happen is to understand what you can and cannot do. To really, really differentiate around what I what you have control over doing in this issue and what you don't have control over doing in this doing in these issues. Um, you know. A lot of these times, our patients, um, these issues have been going on in their lives for decades. And they're not going to be fixed in a 20-minute office visit. So we really have to just really differentiate between what we can do and not, and, and not do. Also, motivational interviewing is amazing with patients in the grasp of, of trauma or trauma survivors. And the reason why is because what that does is it helps us kind of step back not go into that reactive mode, going straight to the pen and pad or straight to the intervention, and kind of look at the other issues that may be hindering or creating obstacles in this patient's life. It helps the patient to draw and reflect on their own issues and evoke their own stuff that's going on. This takes time. It, um, for many of my patients, it's taken up to six months just to get an intervention in place that was going to help be effective for our patients. So we just have to, we have to be more responsive, be more present in these situations, and be mindful yet, yeah, we can, they, we can become very, very reactive. Um, I could do a whole seminar, and if you guys would ever want me back, I could do a whole seminar on that, going into detail around that. And finally, the registration piece is a huge trigger for patients. Um, there's, um, I, I think about our patients with um, traumatic brain injury, um, the, whose patients are, that are already mo emotionally disrupted, disruptive, uh, emotionally dysregulated, having to fill out the same paperwork over and over again. And um, I just think this is a system streamline administrative issue and just really kind of addressing, well, how can we make this less evasive in the beginning and um, more kind of like, um, I, I would say, just a lot more um, simple for the patients. Um, I don't really have an answer for that, but I do know that it it's, it's, it's a very difficult piece, and it, it really comes down to a systems issue and really kind of looking at how this stuff is taken care of. Maybe having a health coach in the front, having a, um, a peer specialist to help a patient during that time might be something that might help with that. But boy, that's a whole other issue, too, that I wish I could answer. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, the peer sub, um, specialist support role is one that's on the list um, for us to maybe do a webinar about or get resources out to folks, so um, people should stay tuned um, around that piece. There was one other question that um, came in, and I wanted to also mention that um, the slides and the webinar recording will be available to folks. There are also a number of other resources on the Institute website around motivational interviewing, which um, Darren referenced, so um, please do check those out and feel free to email us if you have ideas about additional resources you'd like to find or connect with, because um, We'd love to be able to help people get access to tools to make this make this work possible. And the one last question in our last minute is another really deep and loaded one, but I wonder, Darren, if you could talk a little bit about how this intersects with saying no to the misuse of prescribed narcotics, something that um, that a lot of um, organizations struggle with, with how to handle that and how this, this work intersects with that. 
Okay, so saying no is a very difficult thing because what happens with patients that have been impacted by adverse experiences is when we say no, they become reactive a lot of the times. And I have sat in um, many, many offices with physicians, both of us holding each other's hands, as a patient called us every name in the book because we were no longer, because um, the physician has no longer decided that they were going to prescribe to that patient. And that really, I mean, saying no is a very powerful thing for a patient. And we have to really just get comfortable with the uncomfortable notion that um, when we realize that we are causing harm, oh, um, that it's okay to say no and we're just, and we have to realize that it's not about us. All right, we, 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 we have a tendency, and this goes back to that vicarious trauma, we have this tendency to take on our patients' um, issues that are going on as our own as if it's our fault and it's, and, it's, and, it's, and it's our problem. And by saying no in that moment, we're actually, we're not going to be liked for a while, but that's okay. We're actually helping the patient to possibly do something better or support them in some other way. And one of the things I do want to say is when I do have patients that have called me every name in the book when we have said, look, we're going to stop prescribing because we've just noticed that it's not helping, it's actually causing more harm. Yes, we'll get called every name in the book, but a month, two months later, they're back in they're apologizing, they're ready to work on some stuff, and they're, they're ready to do something different. You'll see that a lot of the times. And I've even gotten patients that said, thank you. I'm glad that you actually put up some barriers. So we just have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable with putting up boundaries. All right, thank you so much, uh, Darren, for sharing this wonderful information. And Great. again, folks, there's um, some resources up on the screen. Um, those are linked from the webinar page. And we'll also, um, there are a number of, of related resources available on the Institute website. Um, I hope everyone has a great rest of their Tuesday. And thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, guys.